Anyway, are you glad you came? I hope you are. Um, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to mind the Lord. Uh, I, I, I've had so many uh, good conversations this afternoon with people. And um, it, it's just been sweet to hear what's on your heart. But I want you to turn uh, to the book of Psalms. And um, where was that that I was, where was that verse, Pam, that I was showing you? Where are you? What was that verse? Psalm what? Huh? Psalm 15. <clears throat> no. There it is. Psalm, yeah, it is Psalm 15. You're right. I'm sorry. She, um, she brought a situation to my mind or, and was asking. And I, I love to counsel people as long as I know what verse to show them. Because I don't believe that I've got anything worth saying. And sometimes my feelings or my emotions might say something that my spirit just doesn't agree with. But I like when I can give people scripture for what's going on in their life. And uh, this is not just for one family. This would be for everybody who might be in a situation. I've been preaching on Sunday about loving people and forgiving people. And I understand it's not easy to do that. And I'll, I'm going to tell you this. God didn't design it to be easy to forgive certain people. That way, when you finally forgive them, okay, when you finally forgive them, you will know that it was not you that did it. It was God doing it through you. That way, when we get to heaven, all the crowns will be cast at the feet of Jesus and not us. Amen? But I want you to listen to this. Psalm chapter 15, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? And who shall dwell in thy holy hill? All of us here tonight have one desire. And that is, we want to go to heaven when we die. And we want to stay there for eternity. We, don't want, we do not want to go to hell. We don't want to spend forever down here. Okay? So we're going to reject the technology and the DNA change that they're going to try to implement. We're going to reject it because we got a better plan for that. So those who really want to abide in God's tabernacle, this is for you. He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. You, and well, I, I won't say you, but I will tell you that people all around you lie so much to everybody else that they actually believe their own lies. Like that fish you caught. Or that deer you killed. Right, Matthew? That fish got bigger every time you told it. And that deer's rack in growed, growed horns after it died. And what happens is, and we're capable of this, we can tell a lie so much that to us it becomes the truth. And God bless everybody who not only speaks the truth outwardly, but they'll speak it in their heart. That's the sign that a man's born again. When he'll speak the truth in his own heart. And then verse 3, he that backbiteth not with his tongue... So quit gossiping, quit trying to destroy somebody's reputation because they did it to you, so you're going to turn around and do it to them. As far as I'm concerned, 75% of Facebook is used for that purpose by a lot of people in this world. Can I get amen out of somebody? And again, we're, I mean, we're using Facebook, we're on it right now, we're streaming we post things there. We want, people to be, we want people to be drawn to the Word of God there. It's a way to reach people. YouTube, all of that stuff has a positive way of getting people's attention. But it is used by a lot of people to character assassinate people. They may have done it to you. They may have done it to a member of your family. 
And I've had to learn this. Don't go back at them. Let God deal with it. Let God have it. Okay? You know, it, here's, here's what will happen. The person you are so mad at and so angry, God will save them and they'll come in church and sit down right next to you. That's what God will do. Say, so he that backbiteth not with his tongue nor doeth evil to his neighbor. So your neighbor's dog got in your trash and dumped your trash all over the place and so you decided you was going to kick your neighbor's trash can over while he wasn't looking. God was looking. God sees it. Amen. Nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Verse 4. And whose eyes a vile person is condemned. That means you don't watch Ellen. You don't, you don't honor people who hate God. A vile person is contemned. That means they are contemptible in your mind. And you say, I'm not, not going to look at them. I'm not going to listen to them. I'm not going to have a part of them. See, Ellen has reached out and changed the heart of America because of her comedy. She is funny. And she seems to be this very likable person. But she is a sodomite, an avowed sodomite, a militant sodomite, and despises you because you believe the Bible. So why honor her? Or why honor people like her? But he that he honoreth them that fear the Lord. And then look at verse 4. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. If you've ever had to do that, you understand how hard that is. I've done it. More than one occasion. Where you will swear to something that you know is going to come back and get you. Where if you get into a little fender bender, or you get into an accident and you know it was your fault, you get out and say, I'm sorry, this was my fault. My insurance company will take care of whatever you need, but this was my fault. And your instincts might say, don't say anything, don't condemn yourself, don't do that. Listen, God will honor you God will honor you when you swear even to your own hurt. God will honor you. So what do you want? Do you want man's praise? Do you want man's applause? Do you want to get your way with everybody in this life? Or do you want God to bless you? I want God blessing my life. And if I do something wrong and I know I did it, I'm going to say I did it. Now, I'm, tell, I'm telling you, I've done this both ways. I've lied. Haven't you? Good, because I hate being the only one. I've lied to protect, to cover up. I've, I've done it. But I've also told the truth. And I'm telling you, there's just something better about telling the truth. And the things I've lied about, I wish now I would have told the truth. Because I believe God honors people like that in ways that this world never understands. And then he that putteth not out, not out his money to usury, nor take it. Let me give you some advice. If you've ever loaned money to somebody, don't you dare commit the sin of demanding that money back. Don't you dare do that. You might be saying, oh, I don't believe in that. Let's add up all of your sins. How many were there? And how many of them did God not hold against you? How many of them did God forgive? How many of your sins did God forgive? All of them. And see, this is why we're here, right? This is why we praise Him. This is why we sing those songs and we rejoice. It's because God has forgiven us all of our sins. He's not held anything against us. And He never will. 
So if you loan money out to somebody, and I'm going to say this on the other side, if you borrow money, pay it back, you thief! Don't you dare steal from your mom and daddy. Don't you dare steal from your brother and sister. Don't you dare steal from your church. Don't you dare steal anything from your neighbor. If you borrowed it, you pay it back. And then give them an extra blessing for not charging you interest, for not putting out their money to usury, and for them bailing you out of a spot. Give them something extra, amen. Buy them dinner, who cares? Buy them a cup of coffee, do something nice for them. But then on the other side... If you loan money out to somebody, consider that in your mind it is a gift. If they pay it back, so be it. But why would you risk somebody's eternal soul on a few hundred bucks? Why would you go after somebody who's in your family or who's somebody in your friends or somebody that you know that you're, you want them to come to church, you want them to live for God, you want them to be saved, and yet you're tearing your relationship with them apart because you think they owe you money. And they do owe you money, and you're going to make an issue out of it. What's their soul worth? What is their soul worth to you? And here you have a God who's watching everything you do in every action and every intention of your heart you have a God who is judging and I promise you who you decide to destroy because they owe you something God will destroy you double for that let me give you I want to tell you a true story a true story it happened Jimmy Swaggart back before his fall who remembers that I am sin <laughs> Man's wicked. Jimmy Swaggart made a big name for himself. People sending money all over the place. There was an old woman that died, and she didn't, her family didn't know this, but she changed, her husband left her a fortune. And she had all this money she didn't know what to do with. When she died, before she died, she changed her will, and she wrote it out that Jimmy Swaggart Ministries would get like, it was something like five, ten million dollars. So the lawyer sends a check to Swaggart Ministries. The children of this woman wrote Swaggart and said, Our mama was not in her right mind when she did that. Now we know she loved you and we want to help you out. But that money, our mo you took our inheritance. And you read your Bible about the inheritance. The inheritance for you is heaven. And her children said, You took our inheritance. Will you give it back and then we will bless your ministry? And Swaggart said, absolutely not. So they sued him and lost. Swaggart got the money and then he got caught with hookers in his room. I'm telling you, God is watching everybody's actions and deeds. And he will judge you. Don't think that he won't. He that putteth not out his money to usury. And I'll, let me give you some, else, uh, some other advice too. And I don't think anybody here has ever done that. But I've had it done before. People will send us money. And then they will think that that gives them special access. Or that they can tell me what they want me to say. I don't play that game. I made a deal with God. For when I first started putting videos on the internet, I begged God, God, don't let me fall into the money trap. And I've had people who sent large sums of money. I had a lady who sent, I'm not going to say how much, but she would send a bunch of money every month. I said something about Jesse Jackson and Al Sharptongue. And she come after me, she, call, she wrote me or called me or something like that, and, she, and then she started in. Well, I've been sending you all this money. I said, do you want it back? Because what you cannot do is call me and tell me what you want me to say because you sent money here. And when you put money to usury, you're using that as leverage. Well, I loan you money. That ought to get some kind of loyalty out of you. You wicked thing. 
God will judge you. Can I hear people say, I didn't, listen, I'm being mean already, and I didn't mean to. <laughs> Nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth those things shall never be moved. And Swaggart got moved, did he not? And I will tell you, it wasn't just the hookers in his room. If you've ever read a Swaggart commentary Bible, you'll understand that he has been moved so far away from the Word of God, I don't know that he'll ever come back. God moved him literally away from believing what's in this book because in their commentary, they've changed so much of the Scripture, now it's not even funny. Amen! I, I, I don't know who that was for. I didn't mean to start out mean. I'm just telling you. Act right. Do right. Even if it brings hurt to you. Do the right thing. Amen? God is watching. Amen? First Peter chapter 1. Let's get some revelation in God's house tonight. Amen? Let's get some revelation. This is, I told you this was going to be the theme, and what I'm going to do is start out with this tonight. We're going to cover some ground in this, and then we'll pick it up tomorrow. Now, what I've also thought about doing is, you know, I know some of you may have come and you may have had questions on your mind, or you want me to speak on a certain thing, or somebody brought something up to me already, and I'm going, boy, that'd be a good thing for me to talk about. And um, so here's what I'm going to tell you. If you'll write down tonight on a piece of paper a question or a topic that you would like for me to speak on tomorrow give it to me tonight and I'll look at it and if it means staying up late and working on it I'll do it if I if I think God is in it then I won't mind doing it for you is that fair enough to everybody okay so write it down make sure I can read it okay and any topic any question and I'll just take all that and I'll say, God, what, what do you want me to do with it? And maybe we'll bring it up tomorrow during the day. All right? Boy, we're going to have a good time in the Lord. Amen? We got biscuits and gravy in the house for tomorrow. Amen, Brother John. Poor fella, he's not a fan of biscuits and gravy. Maybe I'll make you some the way my mamma showed me how to make gravy. I make better gravy than the can does, I can tell you that. All right, 1 Peter chapter 1. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober. Underline this, hope to the end for the grace. That is to be brought unto you. Lots of people call me and say, Pastor, I'm, I'm involved in sin and I'm trying to get out and I beg God to help me to, to get out of it. I be, people get caught up in pornography. People get caught up in drugs. People get caught up in alcohol. They get caught up in all kinds of things. Pastor, I, I'm trying to quit. I'm trying to stop. I just don't know how. And it's hard on me. And I just, man, I'm just afraid that I'm not saved. And I said, well, you feel bad, don't you? Yeah, but then you're saved. That's God whooping you. That's God dealing with a son. He's chastising you. And here's what I'm going to tell you. God's grace is always sufficient. It's always sufficient. Always sufficient. His mercy never ends. It never quits. His mercy is brand new on you every day. So what you're to do is hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you. So think about it like this. What God is not doing for you today He's saving it all up to give it to you all at once. Wouldn't that be better? Amen. I mean, let's say your mom and daddy's got a big pile of money and you're going to get that when they die. Now, would it be better for them to give you a dollar a day now? There you go. There you go. Yeah, well, you would have got ten. You would have got ten grand tomorrow, but you ain't getting it now. I mean, let's make a deal here, right? Either take the money now, or wait for door number three to open up. Door number three has got all your money there. You see what I'm saying? God's going to give it to. God's going to do it for you. But He's saving it up to the last day, and then He'll do it to you all at once. Somebody said they had a, a daughter that died. Okay? And that's terrible. But God did something for them in death 
that he could never do for them in life. And that is give them a brand new body. Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you when? At the revelation of Jesus Christ. There is coming a day when Christ is going to be revealed. All of this Jesus that we talk about that people say, I don't believe in it because I've never seen it. I think one of these days he's going to pop up in the air and they're all going to see him. He's going to be revealed and they're going to go, oops. And we're going to go, Woo! We're going to shout amen. All right. Luke chapter 12. Turn to Luke. There's nothing. I'm going to move through some of this fast. There's nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Revelation. God is a revealing God. He reveals. He opens your eyes so that you see things. Uh, my, I was reminded today, my dear brother, Brother Grant, God used that man years ago as a friend to me when I needed a friend. Grant was the one who, in my days of not believing the King James, Grant was a burr in my saddle in this church. Because he was constantly after me going, Mike, it's the King James, brother. It's the King James. There ain't no other Bible than the King James. King James, I'm King James only. And he would try to convince me, and I'd say, look, bud, I've heard all this. I used to be on the other side. Now I don't believe it anymore. And if you can show me original, I mean, I just gave him all kinds of argument. He asked me, the reason why I brought it up, he asked, he sent me a text today and he said, what was it? If you remember, what was it that I said to you that really got you thinking that the King James was right? And I wrote him back. I said, my brother, I don't, I don't mean to offend you, but it wasn't you. And he, I mean, he knew what I was saying. I said, I rejected everything you told me in those days. I rejected all of it. And I said, God had to take me down a trail of thoughts, scriptures. God was connecting things in my mind until one day the Holy Ghost said, Mike, this Bible's right, and you know it. And I immediately surrendered. Boom! I'm, I'm there. I am right now, this second, King James only. And I told him, I said, but buddy, within two minutes, and I'm not exaggerating, within two minutes of that thought coming in my head, I picked up the phone and called him and I said, I'm there. And he knew exactly what I was talking about. Exactly what I was talking about. So, God is a revealing God. What you don't know today, wait. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. God will reveal himself one piece at a time, one verse at a time, one part at a time. He will reveal it. Luke 17, as it was in the days of Noah. Verse 26, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, and they were given in marriage. And think about this. Go back and look at the stories before Genesis 7 and ask yourself the question, who was getting married at this time? It was only one group that the Bible mentions about marrying and giving in marriage. And it was the sons of God and the daughters of men. Just one group. And that's it. So, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of son of man. There's a, there's a marriage coming. A marriage of heaven and earth. But it's not Jesus for, the, for this earth. It's the sons of God. It is the fourth kingdom. Okay, uh, have you been watching the series Giants for those who don't believe? And I really do. I'm, I'm dead serious. I, I, there is one person that I have in mind. I will not say it publicly. If you ask me after we dismiss tonight, I'll tell you who it is I'm talking about. But there is one man that I'm talking about. I'm, I've never met him. I know somebody who knows him. And he's a good man. He loves the Lord, loves King James Bible, solid. Every, but he does not believe those sons of God were angels. And he's come out and uh, really sort of antagonistic against those who believe that. Accusing them of getting it from the book of Enoch. And so my purpose in doing that, I'm making some teachings just for this one person that I'm thinking about. I don't know if he'll ever see it. Even if I send him the DVDs, which I will. When I'm done, I'm going to send him the DVDs. I'm going to say, please watch this. A joint friend, and I'm not going to tell you who it is. 
who knows you recommends this and we'll just see we'll just see we'll let God do it amen okay but anyway verse um, 28 likewise also as it was in the days of Lot now there's another story he wants you to go read they did eat they drank they bought they sold they planted they built it one two three four five six there's six things there interesting but the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus, even thus, shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is what? Revealed. It's a revelation coming. A revelation of Jesus Christ to this whole world. So here's, if you're asking me what I think is going to happen, here's, here's my movie of it. Antichrist is going to be revealed. And they're going to say, this is Jesus, this is the Christ, this is who we follow. God's people are going to go, no, it's not. No, it's not. That's not Jesus. We are going to know our Savior when he appears. We already know what his voice sounds like. Okay? So we'll know him. He's our shepherd. We're going to know. We're not going to be fooled. Don't you worry about that. You will not. God won't let you be fooled. Okay? So that's what I see happening. The world is going to choose the wrong Messiah. We're not going to miss it because Jesus has already chosen us. Galatians 1. Verse 15, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. See, he can be seen now, can he not? He's supposed to be seen in you. Supposed to be. Unless, of course, you loaned your money out for usury. Or you lied on an oath. Then he's not, that's not Jesus being revealed in you, is it? Okay. So, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. And that's what we've been dealing with in Sunday school. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, turn there. Boy, there's a lot in this Bible about revealing Jesus. Showing, he's going to be revealed, he's going to be seen. Um... I know the translation is going to happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. But who says Jesus, once that happens, can't just hang there in the sky for a few hours while CNN covers it? <laughs> I can't wait to see Bill Nye, the science guy's bow tie, come unwound on that day. Whoops! Boy, was I wrong about that! 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7. And to you who are troubled, can I ask, let's do this. If the devil's been really eating on you, let's say in the last month, raise your hand. Good night. It's not just me. By the way, we took Sweetie Pie for her biopsy today. So we get to the place. And they do an ultrasound and they say, we need to do a biopsy. And she said, well, I'm scheduled for one. Let's do it. And they said, oh, we can't do that here because we need an MRI machine on you. So we target the right area. There's two places they're looking at on her. And of course, that's not what she wanted to hear. She is really troubled over this. She, we've been through it before. I think she's going to be okay. I don't want to live without her. I know that. Okay? But it's troubling. When you don't know what God's going to do. Did you hear me? It's troubling when you don't know what God's going to do. So what you have to do then is you have to rely upon all the things that God has already done for you. And remind yourself of those and say, you know what? God's already done good things for me. I mean, I've said this before in, in my rage and in my fear. I've said this to God. God, why did you bring me this far only to destroy me? Because I thought I was going to be destroyed. And of course, God's like, 
I'm not going to destroy you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Ever. So then you remember all the times that God helped you and God saved you and God brought you through. Okay? To you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In fl and what's he doing with those angels? Remember what he said. In the parable of the, of the um, weed and the tares, he said he's going to send forth his angels to gather together what? The tares first, not us. I was wrong when I believed that we were going to be translated before anything else happened. I was wrong in that. I used to believe, I don't believe that anymore because I think the tares are going to be gathered first. Okay? So, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, if you read like Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, he's going to bring the angels and gather together his elect also. That's what those angels are there for. So when that happens, I promise you, you will not be troubled anymore. You'll be like, oh, thank God the cavalry's here. Amen. In flaming fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew about flaming fire, didn't they? Taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They don't believe the Bible. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired. He's coming to be glorified in you. Admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. He's going to be revealed from heaven, he says. While we're in 1 Thessalonians, uh, let me just throw this in. Second Th uh, in uh, 2 Thessalonians, that's chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians 2, you know what that says. There's another revealing. The revealing of the man of sin. Verse 3, chapter 2, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Let me just do, kind of go around the room. Who, who, who has come from a background where you were deceived by any means? What was yours? Oh, I was deceived with that charismatic. Charismatic? Who else was deceived by the charismatic church? Yet several here. Somebody else. What were you deceived by? Yes, ma'am. The Catholic Church. Well, they got a mouthful of deception, don't they? Okay, John. Sabbath keepers. You were deceived by they. Oh, we keep the law. No, you don't. A bunch of filthy liars. You don't keep the law. Who else deceived by something? What was you deceived by? Go ahead. I donated twenty dollars to Jimmy Swagger in nineteen eighty. Oh, good. <laughs> Twenty dollars was two tanks of gas, man, in nineteen eighty. Yeah. But I had enough to admit it. Praise the Lord. Yeah. The, you know, he just took that money, used it for his lawyers, right? So, yeah, that's a good one. That's that's that worked out pretty good. Thank you, God, for that one. That was a pretty good one. Okay. Um. Take heed, let no man deceive you by any means. So, the, I mean, you guys are here because you know I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to tell you what this book says. And not going to stray from it. That way you're not deceived anymore. Whatever I, I, and I said in the prayer a while ago, God, I am going to say something wrong this weekend. I guarantee you, I'm not, can, I cannot be right in everything I say. So that's when you turn back to the word of God. Let God be true and every man a liar. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Who, and he's talking about the day of Christ and our gathering together unto him. That day shall not come except the falling away takes place first. Now, we're going to go to Revelation 10. That's our target for this weekend. 
We're going to put some other things in with it, but our target is Revelation 10. And we're going to examine, I believe that that is Jesus. I believe it. And I'm going to give you the, the reasons why I believe it and why it is where it is. So in Revelation 10, you have this mighty angel coming down. He's clothed with a cloud. His face shines like the sun. He's got the rainbow over his head. That's Jesus. That's the, that's the glory of the Lord in the cloud. The only thing whose face shines like a sun, it's either Moses or Jesus. One of the two. Moses has already faded away, so I know it's not Moses. Okay? So if that's Jesus there in Revelation 10, there's things that have happened before Revelation 10. Revelation 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 have happened before Revelation 10, including the falling. Because in Revelation 6, all the stars of heaven fall. Okay? So that's, I want you to think along those lines. And if I'm wrong, God's going to, I'm telling you, I'm going to get a beating from God that I've never had before. But I'll take it if God then will correct me and give me the truth. I'd rather take a beating for being wrong and then God tell me the truth than to continue in a lie. Amen? Amen. So, uh, the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worship. God is four times in verse 4. Notice that. Uh, the, uh, patterns. There are patterns all in your Bible. And I think those patterns help us reveal the nature of God, how God works. So, if he's God, 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 Four times in verse 4, I think that connects then with a false gospel in the fourth kingdom. I think that's possible what that's really telling us is going to happen. I think it's linking those two things together. And what is that fourth kingdom? At its core, the fourth kingdom is about a marriage of heaven and earth. A marriage where they... Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness mingle themselves with man's DNA. Um, there was an article came out. Several people sent it to me. I was going to mention it yesterday and forgot all about it. But China has, is making a monkey with human DNA. Or a human with monkey DNA. What difference does it make? It's not a monkey and it's not a human. It's a monstrosity. It is an abomination in the eyes of God. God never intended man to mate with monkeys. Never intended that. God said, I made them after their kind and I kept them separate. So in a natural form, humans cannot mate with monkeys and create children. It, God put a prohibition there and he said it'll never work it will never work so man bypasses God's uh, boundary that he had in place and he says then we will create our own human mate or ape hybrid okay I have no idea then what kind have you seen planet of the apes that was one of my favorite shows as a kid, Planet of the Apes. And we're living now, and, and they've done the remake of it, and the remake is they put human brain DNA in a chimpanzee, and he became smart and intelligent like a human. He's dangerous. He's a beast now, and he's dangerous. Okay? And this is what we're doing. So, whew. but that's that fourth kingdom. Them mingling themselves with the seed of men. And we are right there, brother. You said it in my office. He said, I believe we're in the last days. Okay? All right. Now, First uh, Peter 4. Beloved, they cannot strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you fiery trial Satan has fiery darts has he been aiming them at you 
Has he been aiming them at your family? So that's what really gets us. Going after me, that's allowed. Going after my family is not allowed. Okay? And, and I say that to anybody. If you, have a, if you have an issue or a problem with me, then let your problem be with me. Don't you dare take this out on my family. Okay? I don't deal with that well. I love my family. Okay? So he's aiming fiery darts at us to try to get us, to try to hurt us. This is where we need a shield of faith, made of faith. And that faith says, I don't care what you say, devil. I believe what God said. You're a liar. You're a liar, and I won't believe it. Uh, who went to the cave? Onondaga? So my sister goes, there's caves. Um, there's an area of caves in central Missouri, south central Missouri. Merrimack Caverns, Onondaga, Merrimack State Park. Some of these are paved. Some of them you can just go in. And, you know, they have these stalactites, stalagmites. And, of course, they took millions of years. To make those. Right? But you don't believe that, do you? You know, they say, well, we have proof. We can measure this. We know that it took this one at least 100,000 years. And you say, I don't care. God created the earth in six days. Okay? So this, you're going to hang on to that. You're going to need that faith. God's going to reward that. But the fiery darts, the fiery trials coming, he's trying faith, not your works. Your works are already, you've done stupid stuff, you've already judged an idiot. It's your faith that God's going to reward you about. As though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice inasmuch as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be what? Revealed. You may be glad also with exceeding joy. Remember what I said. The grace that is to come to you, God may be just holding it all back for you so that he can give it to you all at once. When he does, you're not going to say, God, I hated that plan. That was a stupid plan. You're not going to do that. You're going to be thankful that God did it that way. All right. Uh, 1 Samuel 3, 20 and 1. The Lord appeared again in Shiloh for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh. How? By the word of the Lord. How did you get Jesus revealed to you? By the word of the Lord. By the Bible. Isaiah 40, verse 5. Every shall be exalted, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low. I, listen, I'm, look at this. Look at what your Bible says. When Christ comes to establish his kingdom, he's going to bring every mountain down and he's going to raise every valley up. And then I guess maybe the world will be flat then. I don't know. <laughs> but he's going to do that. He's going to make all the crooked straight. All the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. It's one of my favorite. Every time I read this, I hear um, Haydn's or Handel's Messiah on this part. If you've never listened to Handel's Messiah, I love it. Because this part here, sung by those choristers, is just absolutely magnificent. For the mouth of... I won't do it. Anyway. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So how is Jesus going to be revealed? It's going to be revealed in the word of God. Amen. You know what? Let's get there. Revelation. Turn to Revelation 10. Yeah, see, there's already so much there. Let's get to Revelation 10. Now, it's 8 o'clock. Now I'm going to start the message. Hey, you didn't come here to lay up in a hotel. Amen. Revelation 1. Yeah, let's look at Revelation 1. We're getting there. John said in verse 12, I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. And his head and his hairs were white like wool, white as snow. Why? Because though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. They took the sins of mankind, placed it upon Jesus' head in the form of the crown of thorns. The curse was laid on him. And now his head is white as snow. 
His eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like undefined brass, as if they burned in a furnace. I want you to think about that. Revelation 10 says almost the exact same thing. And his voice is the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So I, I thought about this one day, and I thought, you know what? This is how, from the perspective of the earth, this is how our solar system is. If, if you're looking at it from earth, Jesus is in the midst of the seven candlesticks. The seven candlesticks, seven stars. So think of the seven planets. Earth is our home, so we're looking at it from that perspective. You have Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Pluto's not a planet. He got demoted. So the sun in our solar system is in the midst of those seven stars from the perspective of us here on this earth. Okay? So I think, you know, people say, well, the earth stands still. I think the earth is not moved in its course. Okay? It's what I think. Now, you may disagree with me on that. That's fine. We won't get into it. All right? Now, Revelation 10. I saw another mighty angel. So now the first question. If this is Jesus, what is he doing here? I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. A rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as it were the sun. And his feet were as what? Remember the description we got back in verse 1? His feet were like undefined brass as if they burned in a furnace. So I think it's the same description. Here, back, back in Revelation 1, his face is shining like the sun. Here in Revelation 10, his face is shining as the sun. So I think it's, I think it's Jesus. And he had his hand a little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. And cried with a loud voice. He says, when a lion roareth. And when he had cried... Seven thunders uttered their voices. So, the question is, what is he doing here? If this is Jesus, what is he, what is, what is, why is he here? Why is he here at this point in the book of Revelation? At this point, the seven seals have been broken and the book has been opened. And at this point, six of the seven trumpets have sounded but not the seventh one yet. But then look at verse seven. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. So right here and right now, Everything that God has declared in his word that is a mystery is now going to be over. The mystery is over. The mystery is done. Go back to 2 Thessalonians. I'm not sure if I even included that in my notes, but I'm going to put it in here. The mystery, of, the mystery of God should be finished. God's going to, everything that he's kept secret, it's now going to be revealed, including his son from heaven. And then, in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now you knoweth, what withhold, now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. So who is the Antichrist? Is it 
I've heard, I mean, I've heard so many. It's Henry Kissinger. No, it's uh, Prince Charles. It's Barack Obama. It's Hillary Clinton. I'd say the beast ain't bad enough for Hillary Clinton, all right? But anyway. Who, who is it? Who is it? We don't know. Yet. We don't know yet. But we're given enough information from our Bible that when he is revealed, I promise you, you will say, that's not Jesus. I promise you that. So, I think the Revelation 10, when the mystery is finished, I think the Antichrist then is revealed. Okay? Now, don't ask me for a day, an hour, what month it's going to be, what year it's going to be. I don't know. And I'll be honest with you, I don't really care. God, the first thing that God did for me when he calls me into study Bible prophecy is he says, Mike, don't worry about the day or the hour. That's not, I'm, don't search for it, don't look for it. It's in my hand and I'm not going to tell you. And what God was doing for me was doing a favor for me. He was relie he's relieving me from that. Mike, I'll give you other things to study, but not that. So, I mean, and I talk to a lot of people who think they have, they have their theories, they have their ideas. I might listen to them a little while, but then I'll say, look, I, I love you. I don't mean to be offensive, but I'm not going to listen to this because we don't know. We don't know. And, I'll, and we know this, that everybody who's come out and said, we calculated the day of the rapture, we figured it out. Steve, they've all been made idiots. Okay? Because most of them said it would have happened already and it didn't happen. 87 reasons why Jesus will return in 1987. And then in 88, his updated book, 88 reasons why Jesus will return in 1980. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. And it's not going to. Amen. All right. Now, uh, Matthew 13. Turn there. Let's look at this mystery. For, we already looked at the mystery of iniquity. Matthew 13 is, as I said, Matthew 13 is loaded with seed parables. The mustard seed parable is here. The parable of the seed and the sower is here. The parable of the wheat and the tares is in this chapter. There is so much in Matthew 13 about the seed and what the seed produces. Whether it's the incorruptible seed of the Word of God, which produces incorruptible salvation. It, it produces an incorruptible new man in you that cannot sin. Somebody say amen. amen. I mean, you're already guilty, but thank God you've got something in you that never sins. It's born of God. It cannot sin. So you have that. Matthew 13, 11, He answers that to them because it is given unto you to know the mysteries, plural, of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. I'll, I'll give you something interesting. The word mystery or mysteries is only found in the New Testament, the King James Bible. The word mysteries mentioned 22 times. The word mysteries is mentioned five times. What do you get when you add those two together? 27. How many books are there in the New Testament? It's a revelation there. The revelation. You cannot understand it by just the Old Testament. You've got to include the New Testament as well, which is why the Jews right now, they're partially blind. In fact, let's go there. Romans 11. Romans 11. You know, I feel like asking this. Uh, we were back there in Matthew 13, and, and like I say, there's all these parables about seed there in Matthew 13. Who's heard something? You know, we talked about the China producing the human-ape hybrid. Who else has heard something recently about messing with genetics, messing with seed? Yes, ma'am.
Probably. Yeah. I haven't heard that one, but it sounds right. This is the three parent children. John, did you say something? Okay, the in vitro children, mixing them together. What do you stir to get them? I don't know. I don't get that. But anyway, mixing a child with more than two parents. That's crazy. Who else has heard something about seed or genetics or DNA or... Yes, John. I don't know if it has so much to do about seed except for the fact that they're now able to make it go a lot faster. So like the CRISPR system, they advanced from Cas9... To Cas3. I remember you sent me that. And now they can actually speed up the process, be more precise, and take out hundreds of thousands of DNA molecules, whatever. So, here's what he just said. Now that we've learned how to alter the genetics of any species, now we've included a turbo lane for it. So, is this science fiction? If I said this, they give you an injection, and within a week, every cell in your body has now turned itself over to that new DNA strand. And everything that you were a week ago is different than what it is now. Is that science fiction or science fact? Science fact, okay? So, I mean, now think of, think of things like this. Let's say your dad and mom millionaires, and they have an inheritance waiting for you. Who are you? You are the you get that inheritance because you are the genetic offspring of those two parents. Once that genetics has been altered, you are not any longer their son. That's weird, but that's how yes. Debbie. I said that. I predicted that. I was right. I got one. I don't know if you heard what she said, but she said they can make a bioweapon that kills only a certain race. Will? Seven dads. Or seven moms. See, that's that gender mess that you've got in your mind that it only has to be men. So, we're, we're living now in the age of genetic apocalypse. The word, you know what the word apocalypse means? Revelation. Apocalypse does not mean mass destruction or the end of the world. It means revelation. Think about that next time you hear that. Something is happening of apocalyptic proportions. It's going to be revealed. All right. Romans 11. For I would not... Bre but that's Matthew 13. And Jesus put the word mystery there in the parable of the seed and the sower. I think... There's a connection there. Okay? Romans eleven twenty five. 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Now, part of the mystery that's going to be completed 
lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. And who's he talking about? Is he talking about the elect, the saved? No, he's talking about the genetic offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's talking about them, and they are partially, you know, I've used this illustration. Left side, right side, left side of your Bible is the Old Testament, right side is the New Testament. They're this blinded. Now it's, it looks like a magazine cover that you've seen, right? There's always somebody posing, covering their right eye. So Israel can't see the New Testament. They're blinded. When you only see out of one eye, you don't, see de you don't perceive depth the way you do with two. So they can't see the depth of the Word of God. They can't see beyond that veil. They don't understand it. But then... Christ is going to be revealed to them. A, the genetic inheritance of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those 12 tribes, a tithe of each tribe, 10%, 12,000, however God counts it out, there's going to be a remnant of the tribes of Israel that that mystery is going to be over with. They're going to know who Jesus is. He's the Messiah. Until the fullness. Now I got an email from somebody asking about what is the fullness of the Gentiles become in. I think, I think it's twofold. Number one, right now God is saving Gentiles. Primarily Gentiles. Every now and then a Jew gets it. But right now he's saving Gentiles. God already knows who the last Gentile on the ark is going to be. He's already got it. And when they walk inside the ark of Jesus Christ, God's going to shut the door. And the Gentiles then, God says, I'm not saving no more. I gave you 2,000 years. What else do you want? But then, I think also the sin of the Gentiles. Think of the parable that Jesus taught about the woman who hid yeast or leaven in three measures of meal three why three lust of the flesh lust of the eyes pride of life and then waited until the lump had risen and I've, I've never baked bread but those of you who have you can just look at a lump and say it's ready right now it's ready it's as full as it's going to get the yeast has done its job now we're going to put it in the oven now we're going to make the bread and I think, think of the world now as a lump with the leaven of the Antichrist in it. And at some point, the sin of this world is going to come to a full, to a head. And God's going to say, I've had enough. And look at the world now. Look at how bad it is. And we're going, God, how much worse is it going to be? Apparently a lot worse. The worst thing that you can possibly imagine, I think, is going to be normal. Look at where we are now compared to where we were 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. Some of you old enough have seen in your lifetime an absolute transformation of every society and every culture in this country. And it's turned bad. Every one of them. It's going to get worse. But God has a line where he says, it's over with. So he sends a mighty angel down from heaven clothed with a cloud. Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, turn there. We're going to cover this much of it tonight. And I'm going to send you home. To my house. Everybody's invited to my house afterward. My wife needs the company. Oh, I can hear her now. Literally, I'm going. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> First Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. Amen. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. See? The mystery of God is finished in the days of the voice of the seventh angel. 
I think those two things are connected. All right? Uh, the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. You see, God is still not done fulfilling scripture in your life. And he won't be until you either die or are changed. Then it will be brought to pass. Then God will fulfill it. But between now and that date, rest assured, God is going to fulfill every word for you from this book in your life. Isn't that a neat promise? He's not going to fail in fulfilling his word to you. Not going to fail. Uh, and then Paul said this in Ephesians 5. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. What was he talking about? The husband and the bride. The marriage. The, the joining together of Jesus, who is the husband. He is the bridegroom. The church, which is his bride. And he includes that in the mystery. So here again, this is why I'm saying this. When that angel appears... With the book in his hand, his feet on, the, feet, feet on the sea and on the land, the mystery of God then will be finished. And part of that mystery is Israel is going to be saved. Another part of that mystery is the translation is going to happen. Another part of that mystery is the Antichrist is going to be revealed. And another part of that ministry is the bride gets to meet her husband. Amen. God's going to walk us down the aisle himself. Somebody say amen. I did include it in my notes. 2 Thessalonians 2, we've already covered that. Um, you know what? Let's do this. Let's see how much more we have. Yeah. Let's do this. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2. And I want to kind of get your opinion on something. I'm not the only person here that believes the Bible. Am I? No, of course not. So, verse 11 in 2 Thessalonians 2. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. What do you think that delusion is? What do you think it is? Will? Right. Come to earth. I, and I think they're going to believe, hey, these are the beings that we talk about, the UFO, the aliens. Here, here it is. The Bible can't be true because here they come. And I think that has really something to do with it. I want everybody to look around this room. I want you to look at everybody here. There's somebody in this room that's seen a UFO. They have. Okay. Speaking of God, they just spotted one in West Kelowna. You're from Colo West Kelowna, I'm British Columbia? Kelowna, Brit British Columbia. And, they, and their woman was, uh, she filmed it. Mm hmm. And it was just like a week and a half. What, did, what was its shape, you know? Is it like a saucer or a triangle or? Okay. Okay. This round wheel looking thing. Okay. So somebody in this room, I'm not going to tell you who, has seen a, a ship in the air that did not act in a way that leads you to believe that it was made or manufactured anywhere here. It moved in such a way as to defy the laws of physics. Okay? I believe them. I believe them because I know from the scripture what they are. Okay? So, Will, you're saying 
that when those angels are cast out of heaven, they're going to come down here and they're going to present themselves to earth as the Savior gods. Correct? Something similar to that. Okay? Who else has got an idea? Yes, ma'am. Wow. And I didn't believe it. I was just driving. I was like, oh, that's a weird thing. And, you know, and then I left it. But later on, it was on the news. And I was telling wow. people who were like wondering what if people, people were questioning what it was. They didn't have any conclusions. But it didn't make the news. It was really, I, I saw this fire calling Did the Bible not say there would be signs in the heaven? Okay. Yes? I think she said that she saw the same thing you did. Is that right? That's what she's saying. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Amen. I like you. She's saved by the grace of God. Amen. Somebody else got an idea of, of that strong delusion. Strong delusion. What do you think? Yes. Well, some are waiting for their false messiah, the false imam. Yeah. Eva, I think strong delusion encompasses that antichrist. We're looking to believe in anything but our Savior, our King, King, and they're going to get it. That's my opinion. Yeah. Think of Matthew 24 when Jesus told us about the events that were going to happen. Many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. So that fits with what you said, I think. The many coming, and they're saying, Jesus sent us down here. We are Christ. Jesus sent us here to save this earth from itself. Okay? I think, that's, I think that could very well be it. Anybody else? Yes, Sister Pam. Yeah. Tom DeLong, the rock and roll star from Blink-182, has started a company called To The Stars Academy of Arts and Science. He's hired artists, uh, movie makers, whatnot. He's hired scientists. And according to their statements, they have what they call tangibles. Now what that means is that they are in possession of some form of technology that did not originate from this planet. Okay? Now, if that can be proven and it's real, so they come out with something, technology that they know cannot have ever been made anywhere on this earth. And they say, here it is. Who's going to have an answer, a correct answer, as to what that really is? Because we believe there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, and we believe that we are his unique creation and there is no other people on other planets who could come here but they bring something out or thousands of them are hovering in the sky above every square inch of earth what answer are we going to be able to give to this world they're not going to listen to it anyway but at least we're going to say uh, excuse us we know what that really is because God's going to reveal it. He's not just going to tell it me. He's going to reveal His Word to all of His people. What He wants them to know in that day.
Arm yourself. Amen?